Casual Diary Podcast, episode 314. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cashflow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cashflow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because we're going to talk about something that we really actually haven't talked about a a ton, or we haven't talked to this type of entrepreneur, I I think only one other time, as far as I can possibly remember. Now, what's really cool for me is that today's entrepreneur happens to be an owner of what would easily be my favorite restaurant, and I am always there. As some of you are thinking Starbucks right now. Nope, nope, nope. I'm, a, I'm going to let you linger on that just a little bit more as I tell you a little bit more about him. It, he likes to do things in pairs. What do I mean by that? He's got two Guinness World Records. He has two of these restaurants. And what's really, really interesting is that this time he went to overachieve and he has six children. So two, two equals two plus two equals six in this particular case, which is pretty cool. But what's more important than any of that is that he's got lessons. He understands adversity. He understands how to lead and most importantly, thinking different. Now, if you're wondering what restaurant, I'm still not going to tell you yet. I'm going to let him do it. Help me welcome Mr. Arthur Greeno. Arthur, how are you? I'm doing great. Good, good. Now, uh, you heard me mention a, a particular restaurant. I won't tell them yet because I want them to sit in suspense just a little bit longer as you answer the first question that I tend to ask everybody. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. So I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. cetera. Um, and I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common, specifically uh, when you think about a superhero, they get, you know, dressed up, they maybe they fly, they've got special skills and abilities. And entrepreneurs, we feel the same way. We occasionally we get dressed up, maybe we don't put on a cape, or well, maybe we do put on a cape. Uh, at the end of the day, though, just like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning, a superhero has a beginning, they have an origin story. So, what we want to know is. Before the world records, by the way, that that had to be one nice cup of sweet tea. But before the world records, before the authors, uh, before the books, before the two stores and all of these other things, we want to know who is Arthur Greeno. All right. Well, uh, before all of that, Arthur Greeno was um, honestly, he was kind of lost. Uh, He was... uh, he, he struggled with his identity. His, uh, you know, it, it's funny that you mentioned superheroes because I love superheroes. In fact, <laughs> uh, I'm on the board for some guys who started up a comic con here in, in Oklahoma. Nice. Yeah, and so, um, so my my office is plastered with superheroes, and uh, and I kind of look at myself kind of like Spider Man. Okay, this is good. Yeah, and so um, I looked at the adversity that Peter Parker had, even though my parents weren't dead, um, you know, didn't right. die at a young age. Um, my, my family struggled with alcoholism and a lot of other things. And so I had a really hard time trying to figure out what I wanted to do or the direction to do it in. Got it. Got it. Okay. So what were some of those early, uh, we'll call them early warning signals that helped you to begin to discover, if you will, Hey, I've got a superhero ability here. Yeah, the uh, for me it was that when I looked at the people that I surrounded myself with, or that my family surrounded themselves with, I I realized that's not the kind of people that I want to be hanging around with for the rest of my life. <laughs> you know, many people don't want to hang around their family, <laughs> but okay, you might want to expound on that just a tad bit more. 
Well, I didn't necessarily necessarily mean my family. However, there are times in every relationship um, <laughs> that you wish you weren't around your family. Uh, but it was more like the people that my parents associated with. I see. Um, the people, you know, they they tend to hang around with people that, well, they like to get drunk a lot, or they would they would spend their time uh, uh, just not being productive at all. They'd be running the race, but yet they wouldn't be going anywhere. And and I said, you know what? I want to be. I want to make sure that that we not only are surviving for my family, but I'm taking care of my family. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so that was one of the big things. And I said, you know what? Um, the people that are around me right now aren't going to teach me those things. I see. So there was a conscious decision for you. It's like, look, I, I need to <laughs> change the 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 environment in which I'm I'm naturally in. Yeah, it was a, um, not only was it a conscious decision, it was very, very deliberate. And I had to look at the people that I surrounded myself with and who my family surrounded themselves with and say, what kind of people do I want to associate with? And if um, and if we're to look at, you know, superpowers or whatever, that's one of the things I've really learned over the years is that if I need if I need to learn something, I need to find those gurus, those Yodas, those people that are out there that have the knowledge that I need. And how do I connect with them? You know, I never thought about Yoda as a superhero, but I don't see why not. <laughs> I like it. So let me let me ask you this, though. What, what would you say then has been that path? I mean, you know, many times people will, at least when they're getting started or when we're getting started with something, we hope and believe that the path to success is just going to be one straight arrow in the positive direction. Describe for us what that journey has been and looked like for you. Well, what it looked like for me is, you know, when I was in uh, when I was in high school, and I was uh, and and I that was when I really first made the decision of I want to surround myself with different people. Uh, so I did. I looked at those who were successful in high school, who were successful in life, and I surrounded myself with them. And it was not an easy path at all, especially with the background that I had. I I would uh, I remember at one point I was trying to convince one of my friends. I was trying to convince his mother to allow me to be his friend. What? Yeah, she, um, you know, she knew my background and I like to use, how should we say, a lot of colorful metaphors and in their family, they didn't, they didn't like to use those. And, uh, but that's the kind of environment that I was in. So that's, that's how I grew up. But yet I saw how I was becoming a better person when I hung around with others. And, and, you know, I understand, you know, her perspective because honestly, I'd be kind of thinking the same thing with my child. Right, right, right. So, interestingly, um, you got good at sales in a completely different way. I did, I did. Well, part of that also when I was in when I was in high school, on top of you know the the alcoholism that that ensued my family and other things, I got diagnosed with scoliosis. Oh, and so I have an S curve. My back is. Um, if you look at the pictures, you you'd probably think, man, how does this guy even stand up? Mm. But when I was in high school, I remember standing in the doctor's office and he said, we're going to fit you with a brace that goes from your chin all the way down to your, your um, pelvis. And I was thinking, man, this, this has got to be a chick's magnet. <laughs> okay, I'm listening. <laughs> and so, so I, rem- I remember literally standing there just crying in, in the doctor's office, you know, at 17 years old, of course, with... Um, oh with, this like, was at uh, 17. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 16, 17. And, oh, no. uh, and, and I was, I was furious about it. And, uh, and, but here's the thing is that when that happened to me, when you're wearing a back brace like that, there's no way that people aren't going to notice you. Yeah. True. There's, there's no being a wallflower. Everybody notices you. In fact, um, uh, in fact, one of my, um, I, I learned with that back brace that, if I would drag my feet on the ground, I would collect a lot of static electricity. And and one day I was walking up to my friend and I was I was dragging my feet on the ground. I had my arms outstretched with one finger out there. And I knew that if I got close to my friend, I could zap him. And and I was dragging my feet and I was about to touch him. And uh and and I and I did that and I zapped him and it was awesome. But his his brother and, and his and his brother's girlfriend was standing on the other side of the auditorium, and she looked over me and said, "Oh, look at that! You know that poor handicapped boy." And, uh, and my friend's brother just kind of laughed and said, "Oh yeah, that's Arthur." 
And he never, for years, he never clean, cleared that up with her until, you know, later she realized that I was, you know, somewhat normal. <laughs> right. Somewhat normal. Yes. Yes. That's interesting. Okay. So this gives you a, puts you in a different perspective uh, for sure from the beginning. Now, um, talk to us, Will, if you will, a little bit about your work history. And of course, now we're going to have to tell them what it is that is my favorite restaurant that is out there. So tell us a little bit about your work history, if you will, and how it leads to where you are today. Sure. Well, my work history was when I was um, 16, 17 years old in my back brace, I actually started working at McDonald's. Nice. Now, you know, I'm assuming that's not your favorite restaurant. Um, no. Nah. They do serve a good burger. Really? Uh, Maybe in Oklahoma, <laughs> but not out here. If you go to the right ones, but 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 don't tell the cows that because mm. they, they get really upset when they, when they hear me say things like that. Of course, they want you to eat more chicken. That's right, they do. <laughs> they do. So I went right from McDonald's to working my first job, making six dollars an hour as a cashier at Chick Fil A. Got it. So. Um, so I started working there the day that they opened at, at, at a mall location here in Oklahoma. And uh, and at that point, I kind of fell in love with the company. Interesting. Now, what what made you, what would you say then uh, gave you the ability to fall in love with the company? What was it? Well, here's what happened for me. And so, you know, I explained a little bit about my family and our history. And, um, and, and one of the big pivotal points of my life was I'd worked at Chick-fil-A for a little over a year. My younger sister, she just turned 18, just had her second child, and she was, she was down in Dallas. She just got her GED, and uh, she was in a car wreck and passed away. And oh, I went wow. down. Yeah. And so I went down there, and I was the only one with a, um, with a credit card that could, pay for, that could pay for her funeral out of my entire family. So I, I paid for her funeral. I came back home, and, uh, and the owner-operator there looked at me and said, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. You're trying to work four jobs. Um, you're trying to support yourself. I was an art major at, at Oral Roberts University at the time. Never planned on owning a business ever. <laughs> uh, and uh, he said, I'm going to send you on a vacation. And so I, I actually went to a grand opening for a Chick-fil-A, um, wore the chicken suit. Nice. Um, our time. Yep, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but what I learned is how Chick-fil-A loved their customers how they love the operators, how they love the team members. And at that point is when I really fell in love with Chick-fil-A. And I said, I want to own a Chick-fil-A. And, and so I went back to my uh, old toolbox and said, if I'm going to do that, I need to surround myself with people that own Chick-fil-A's. Right. So when I came back to Tulsa, that's the first thing I started doing is, is start associating with any of the owners in the area and any of the owners in Oklahoma City and anyone that would come to town and I would, I would grab them and I would ask them questions and how, what am I supposed to wear? How am I supposed to dress? What are they learning about? And that's when I learned the value of books because frankly, in high school and college, I just read the books because it was required. Right. And um, what I heard was that Chick-fil-A loves a learner. They love people who are, who are learning things. And so I got the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which was the, mm -hmm. the trendy book at the time. Mm -hmm. And so when Chick-fil-A asked me, well, what are you doing to learn? And I said, oh, I'm reading Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, at that time, I probably only completed about four full pages in that book. But I was very honest. I, I was reading it. Right. And so and that's when I, I knew. I said, you know what? I want to own a Chick-fil-A. And that, that's where kind of my road started. Got it, got it. Now, this is interesting. One, besides the fact that you can just have Chick-fil-A anytime you want, and that's just awesome to me, but the, the whole thought process of going from, well, McDonald's to Chick-fil-A, that's a completely different environment, but it speaks to the fact that something about the culture in which you, when we're building a business, the, the culture, and that could be one of the reasons we attract the star talent or the, our next contractor or vendor that, that we need. Uh, what was it about the, the culture that when you say it's clear that they love their customers, how, how can we as an entrepreneur adopt some of those things? That can help our customers go, hey, they like us. They love us. They, they you know, and, and they can have that same type of experience or feeling. Sure. Well, I think the simplest way is to kind of boil it down to is, is at a lot of, if you think about when you go to a lot of fast food places or other places, if there's something wrong with your order, 
sometimes you need to get in a big argument with the person um, just to get, you know, that, that piece of cheese that you were expecting or, mm. or maybe, or maybe a, a refund, mm-hmm. you know, but, but one of the philosophies behind Chick-fil-A is, is to be generous. And so if somebody has a sandwich that isn't right, I don't care uh, when, when we say it's not right, it could just be the bun doesn't look right or it doesn't taste funny. We're not going to argue about it. You know, the object is let's just fix the situation. I like it. Yeah, yeah, I totally like that. It's one of the uh, one of the reasons I. <laughs> it's pretty funny. One of the reasons I actually go to Chick Fil A is for the consistency. Regard, and it's been one of the most consistent restaurants I've ever experienced across. And I've been many different places, many different states, many different stores. It's almost like, hey, right? I get off the plane. Where's the Chick Fil A? Um, and yet, without fail, it's one of the few places where you order the food and before like you're done ringing up the food is ready i'm like that is awesome for me (laughs) personally uh and from a customer standpoint i'm like yes this is these people are on it and that gives me that same feeling my question to you is in order to deliver that experience one has to learn systems and, and and things of this nature coming from your background what was that what was that like well at first it was really tough because i had never taken a business class before in my life Right. And when I got the very first store that I had. And so, you know, I had the mentality of, oh, we can just make this happen. We'll fly by the seat of your pants. But I learned very, very quickly how important systems were. Mm. And, um, you know, systems all the way down from, um, you know, that at my restaurants, we have a, a system, a checklist that we check the bathroom um, at certain times of the day, believe it or not. So when it comes to learning these systems and executing them, what were some of the challenges you faced? Because I, you know, many entrepreneurs, yeah, we fly by the seat of our pants. We're just ready to get it done, get something done if we can. Um, What were some of the biggest things that you're like, oh, I I didn't realize that? Oh, well, it was when I first jumped into it, uh, it was uh, an eye opening experience for me because. I mean, we, we jumped into, you know, we have systems for really just about anything. I mean, anything from um, balancing the safe to mopping the floors to, you know, the bathrooms to, uh, you know, to what we do with waste chicken. I mean, it's just it's system, 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 system. And it, it was a hard lesson for me to learn because I remember at the very beginning, I was really struggling with some things. And of course, I went back to what I always do. And I found, I said, who's the best owners in the chain? Mm. And I asked the home office that and they told me. And so I went to them and I said, look, I need to learn from you. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm stealing every idea that you have. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and, and and you'd be surprised how many people are graciously will give it to you. And uh, I've learned over the years that I never want to reinvent the wheel. Right. So I'll always ask them, hey, do you have a template for this? And they give it to me and I can I can modify it. But I would I would go into their stores and I would learn about what the best people do. And I was watching how, you know, when I was struggling as a as early owner where I would have money missing on a regular basis, he would say, well, here's what I do. We balance it at this time of day and uh, and uh, we count their money as soon as they're done, uh, as soon as they're done with their shift. And some of those were new concepts to me. Mm, interesting. Interesting. So. It, it, that what's interesting about this is that at times one can feel like because they have an exposure to a certain industry because you you worked there for how many years first? Uh, I had worked at Chick Fil A for um, about four years, McDonald's for two years before I even became an owner. Yeah, and and that's what I'm saying. We can feel like because we've had exposure to an industry, we we go, oh, I know what to do, or I know that. I mean, I know a number of people. You know, whether they're property managers, they've been leasing agents, they are oh, the construction people. They're like, hey, I know real estate. I I can you know fix walls. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know that part. But that one part is not the entire system. And that's and even when you're there, you, you, you don't pick it up from osmosis until you're on that other side. That's correct. And the other part about that is what if the person was trained wrong? I can't tell you how oh, many. Wow. You know, sometimes I'll bring people in from either other fast food places or sometimes even Chick-fil-A. And the process that they that they were using somewhere else might have been flawed. And so it doesn't end up working with us. Interesting. 
I didn't even, I wasn't even thinking about that, that <laughs> correcting a, a wrong training situation. So when it comes to the, so now I've, I've got to ask the question because somebody's going to email me if I don't. <laughs> um, wh- how on earth do you come from working there to having the money to buy one? Okay. So, uh, years ago, I mean, the cost to own a Chick fil A is only five. Well, years ago, it was only $5,000. Okay. I'm writing a check. No, All right. No, no. <laughs> so, so it was only $5,000. Nowadays it's $10,000. But before everybody starts writing checks, um, as Dan Cathy, Dan Cathy is one of my mentors. And one of the things that he uh, says is that it's easier to get into the CIA than it is Chick fil A. What? They get 20,000 applications a year to fill about 60 spots. That's worse than any college in okay this keep going yeah. i'm listening <laughs> it's, it's crazy i mean and and some of that is you know at the very starting process where people fill out an application online and then they have a vetting process um and then it strategically gets um harder and harder but you know the thing is with chick-fil-a is they don't they want to have the best person in there and the, and there's so many people wanting to be a chick-fil-a operator that uh, that Chick-fil-A gets the opportunity to be very, very, very picky. And so they kind of, it's kind of a joke that they say, uh, uh, we look for the fastest way to tell somebody no. <laughs> right. Be- because they want to get them on with their life. I mean, if Chick-fil-A isn't it, it's not, it's not made for everybody. And, and they come in and, uh, and like, even for myself, I have a lot of people that come in and say, I want to work for you as a manager because I want to learn about Chick-fil-A so I can go on with Chick-fil-A. And I have, uh, I've had people come in and they just did, they just couldn't make it work. Wow. Interesting. And what, what's really interesting to me is that, that says a lot about the brand when there's that much demand for very few spots. Uh, it says a lot about everything from the top down and not only the quality of the systems, et cetera. Um, I can tell you, I wasn't expecting a number as low as 10 grand, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but yet that also says that it's really not about the money. There's something else in the filtering process. So what would you say is like the, the thing, if someone's listening right now and thinks, because we haven't talked about franchising much, uh, at all. And <laughs> so the, what would you say from the person listening right now? If they were like, Hey, I want to build cash flow, but maybe real estate isn't their thing. It's not what they want to do. They want to have a business, but maybe they're lacking a business idea. Uh, and I think this is a place where franchising can come in. What would you say has been, what would you say are some of those benefits and, and things that like, yeah, this is why friend, this is who franchising is for. Okay. Well, you probably want to be in business. That's why you listen. And that's great. And I think it's awesome that you want to take some unique product or service or your unique abilities and put it out there into the marketplace. Please do. Now, understand that there are many different types of business models out there. For example, just because you say you want to be in the restaurant business, that doesn't mean you're going to own a restaurant. You could actually, uh, as a direct owner, you could own it as a franchise. Maybe, and, and maybe somewhere there's a network marketing restaurant. I don't know, but you could still be in business without having to have a certain type of business model. Just keep that in mind. Just because you're you're in retail, just because you're in distribution, you could do things in a very, very different way. And the business model, each one of them, has many pluses and many different minuses. So just look at that as you go through the process of putting together what it is you think is going to be the best business plan for yourself. If you want some ideas on how to do this in real estate, of course, feel free to go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. That's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book and grab a copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. And that will give you some of my best ideas and business model. Nonetheless, let's get back to it. Yeah, Chick-fil-A, it, first of all, it's very unique anyway because the franchise agreement, the operator agreement that they have um, is very unique in and of itself. And they um, it's they want you to be working in the restaurant. They want you, they want me to be there in the restaurant making sure that hmm. um, that things are right. And so it's not the traditional franchise that that somebody could come and purchase it and then get it started and then run off and, and go spend their time 
you know, opening other franchises. They, they want you to be in there all the time. And that's one of the reasons that uh, when you go into stores, they have such a um, high level of excellence. They actually, Chick-fil-A actually says that we want, we strive for perfection, but we'll settle for excellence. <laughs> Got it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. And so by those owner operators being in, in that location, they're there all the time. And, and, you know, if you look at some of those franchises that, that struggle or that you walk in and don't get the quality that you want or the experience that you want, take a look at where the managers are. You know, generally the managers that are running that are just hired managers that actually don't ever know who the owner is. That that's an interesting concept right there. Uh, so you're saying keeping it close to the vest is probably what allows them to maintain that quality in various different ways. Now, let me ask you this then. Um, so you're basically if someone does anybody own like 10 or 20 of these things, because that would be really tough to do with that as a as a requirement. Yeah, the the most stores that an owner has at this point is three. Okay. And, and it, I mean, they're studs. I tell you, they're uh, I mean, there's a lot involved, but um, it's not as simple as just owning three. The, the locations need to be somewhat close to each other where where they're marketing to the same people like the two locations that I have. Um, they're right in between, believe it or not, um, a high school. Um, it's called U- Union High School. And that's the high school that I went to. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So so when we talk about, you know, a local rags to riches story. That's me. And so when I'm going around town and doing speaking and other stuff, I can literally say, hey, I went to high school right there. But but when I'm marketing or when I'm recruiting, I can walk right into the high school because I know everyone there and I can recruit for both my stores. I can market to both my stores. And so, you know, that's kind of one of the things that they're looking for. If I had a, another store on the far side of town, I'd probably have to adjust my way of marketing. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to get the leverage with the same marketing dollar is basically what I'm hearing. So, OK, exactly. that, that that's interesting. That's interesting. So when it comes to but when it comes to just being a, a franchise uh, owner in and of itself, is there anything that you think that when you think about other business models out there where you go this business model in general, whether it's Chick-fil-A or not, um, is is superior for these reasons? I apologize. Are you asking me if I uh, if I'm thinking of any other franchises out there? No, no. I'm just saying not necessarily franchises, any other franchises. I'm trying to figure out what are the superior aspects from the insiders at from your vantage point. What do you think uh, a franchise has over as an advantage over other business models? Well, I think I think uh, one of the biggest things is just the level of accountability. Oh, what do you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So let's start with, you know, like a Chick-fil-A versus others. We have the owner operator um, that is accountable to the expectations and the recipes and and the other things that the Chick-fil-A Incorporated um, puts out there. Hmm. Well, because I'm in the store all the time, um, they come right to me to get the problem solved. Uh, But on top of that, on top of um, on top of just the corporate expectations, they also put different things in there. They provide us with tools to make sure that the accountability uh, that it's it's happening. For example, we have on a regular basis, they actually kind of expect on a regular basis that we're doing an internal survey of our quality of food, of our of our employees, of uh, how our store looks. And we actually have a, a process that we can go through and I can have my team members go through and inspect all those things. And that's weekly. Got it. Then on top of that, Chick-fil-A Incorporated also has somebody come out every quarter and they come and kind of do an external audit of the almost the exact same things. Then on top of that, we do customer service, customer surveys on a regular basis. And, it, um, it, and I kid you not, almost on almost every time, if I look at the customer surveys and what the customers are saying, I can, I can do kind of a cross reference and look at what my scores are saying from either the corporate office or, or inside my store, and they're always close to the same. For example, if my taste of my product wasn't right, I could look and say, well, that makes sense because we haven't been meeting the timer expectations here. Wow. So it's, it's pretty detailed, but I think that's one of the reasons that makes a Chick-fil-A franchise, and there's many other franchises like that. And here's one that's not a franchise, uh, Quick Trip. Quick Trip? 
I don't know what that one is. So Quick Trip is a, is a gas station chain. They're based out of um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and they have phenomenal hot dogs. I, I have to say. <laughs> okay. Um, but but they have a great um, and a great. It's a great gas station, and uh, and a lot of a lot of people in the area compare Chick Fil A to Quick Trip's customer service. Well, their customer service over there is phenomenal because they have very stringent uh, accountability. Interesting. They, they pay their managers very high to high to uh, so that um, they can't expect those things. And then they come, they have someone come in and do mystery shops on the regular basis. Then they have someone come in and do mystery shops over the mystery shoppers. Wow. And so it's just that multiple levels of accountability. And if you look at any really good, successful franchise, it's those that have those multiple levels of accountability in there. And what's funny is there's a number of people that say, I don't want that. So they back away from those franchises because they say, oh, I want a little bit more flexibility. But yet, you know, really the ones that are super successful are the ones that have those levels. Got it. Got it. Totally understood. Now, I just want to make sure I heard something right, though. Did you say you get to do internal quality control of the food? Does that mean I get you, you get to eat the chicken? Absolutely. No. Every day I have to walk through and eat every single product. Oh, that's it's painful. That's just that's just horrible right there. I don't even know what I'm going to do. Um so what other than the the uh, accountability is there any cuz I now that I'm listening to it I'm like okay cool lots of checks and balances that makes sense. What would you say would be any other advantages of a, being a franchise owner versus a, any other form of business? Well, I think one of the things for the franchise owners it's kind of a double edged sword in a way but you know the home office can provide you um, artwork or if you're trying to do some marketing, there's always, kind of, you know, there's always someone out there that can give you some assistance. Mm. You know, mom and pop places, you kind of got to make everything from scratch. Mm -hmm. And um, and it saves a lot of time when you can just go into a, a program and say, hey, I need that and I need that and I need that. Um, and that that really does make a big difference. Interesting. Okay. Got it. Got it. So would you say the the... A home office does the heavy lifting or the franchise owner does the heavy lifting? I think um, on a on a high level, the home office does. But then what they do is they provide these opportunities for us to, to bring it down to a local level. For example, you had mentioned about my Guinness World Records. Yes. So, for example, there's no protocol from Chick-fil-A to, um, to set a Guinness World Record. No, but you did it. Now I understand why it was sweet tea. <laughs> that's, right. that's right and so um uh so so there, there's kind of a joke at the home office and and my accountant one time told me you know arthur we, we kind of laugh about you sometimes and said there there's either a rule made uh because of arthur greeno or about to be a rule made because of arthur greeno <laughs> yeah yeah okay and, yeah i get it though yeah and so when i called them when i first called them about the guinness world record they didn't in fact they didn't they so didn't know what to do with me that somebody was, believe it or not, at my doorstep 24 hours later <laughs> wanting to talk to me about my idea. <laughs> you want to do what? Yeah, okay, got it. Now, for those that are wondering, can you tell them what the the world record's about? Because they, they don't know yet. Yeah, so, so I did a couple of different Guinness World Records. The very first one was the world's largest lemonade. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, Chick-fil-A has this phenomenal fresh squeezed lemonade. And, and the, does. The, the, the secret is lemon juice, water, and sugar. <laughs> you know, now some people may think we mix some drugs in there a little bit, but no, no, that's, that's it. Just those three ingredients. Yeah, yep. I get it. I get it. And how, and how big was the, the lemonade? It was, um, it ended up being 840 gallons. Wow. And we had to squeeze 100,000 lemons uh, in order to make it happen. <laughs> okay and for those wondering why you would do this what I, I know that i'm curious to hear what brought about the idea and how did that impact your business well it, it really started because i have six kids and you know we're talking about guinness world records and they're saying dad you know i mean they're looking at me you know like any any young kid would looking at their dad and saying he can do anything dad you should you should do some of these guinness world records and they're opening this book that has this guy with like four feet long, you know, fingernails or oh, laying yeah, on a yeah. bed of nails. And I'm kind of going, yeah, let, let's, let's do something in my wheelhouse. <laughs> right. And so I said, well, is there anything food related? And so we started kind of talking about that and started saying, well, 
can we pull this off? And so it kind of started as a joke. But then as I started thinking about it, I was like, well, why can't we pull it off? And and then I started realizing we can pull it off. It's going to take some work. And so so that's what we did. And 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 I started with, you know, I needed a giant cup. I needed <laughs> I needed a nine foot cup. And so I was going driving all over Tulsa and um and walking in with a Chick-fil-A cup saying, Can you make this? You know, and I went to a plexiglass place on um, um I went to a plastics company and and, and I even went to a, a big uh, place that did barrels. I was like, you think we can make a giant barrel? And they're like, no, not that big. And, uh, I mean, everyone looked at me like I was, you know, crazy. But I had been, you know, um, looked at like I've been crazy, you know, from when I was in high school with a back brace on, trying to run track with a back brace on. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm used to it. So it's no big deal for me. Uh, and so, um, and then I'm driving down the road and I look off to the side. And I think when it comes to being creative, a lot of people think creative people just come up with these ideas just instantaneous. I think sometimes we need to um, start the idea and let it kind of um, sit there and fester. And then an opportunity will come forward. And for me, I looked out and I saw this 45,000 gallon uh, pool that, that was made out of fiberglass. And I thought, well, if they can do a fiberglass pool that big, <laughs> why, sure. you know, why, why can't they do a cup? So, so I drove to this fiberglass place and I went in there and the, and um, and you know how on all the James Bond movies and and uh, movies that they have spy gadgets, there's there's this this little you know um, wormy guy in the back that has really thick glasses and um, <laughs> and he's like you know oh we can do this you know I mean that's I walked in and there's a guy like that I'm thinking <laughs> cool yes. And so I, I set the cup down and I said, I want this, but I want it nine feet tall. And he didn't say a word. He just got out his pen and his paper and started sketching and then doing all these calculations that I didn't know anything about. Uh, I didn't do very well in school and in math. And and so um, after a couple minutes, he slides it forward and says, yep, we can do it. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. And so, so I said, okay, well then let's do it. And, and, you know, he came up with some ideas like we had to put a liner in there to make it food safe. And, uh, and so, um, that's actually when I called Chick-fil-A and they decided to, you know, hop on a plane and come talk to me about my idea. <laughs> but, but then what I learned over the years is when you want to do something big, people want to be a part of it. I mean, everyone wants to be a part of something big. A lot of people just don't know how to do it. Right. And so, so we started going through the routine of, well, you know, I started reaching out to um, Sunkist and they donated all the lemons and I, I reached out to the sugar company and they donated all the sugar. And so here I am creating this thing. And it's going to cost me nothing. Mm. And so then, then, well, how are we going to squeeze these lemons? So, I, so I got about 10 lemon squeezers from the Chick-fil-A corporate office and barred them. And then we had a contest for my crew, you know, kind of like Tom Sawyer did where, um, where he made everybody do the work, I made all squeeze lemons. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, yeah, I was actually wondering. I was like, how did I was waiting to hear how did you squeeze all these lemons? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so they squeezed them and they enjoyed it, and we gave away free Chick Fil A for a year to the team that could squeeze the lemons the fastest. And you know, we knocked it out, and uh, I had Guinness World Record come in, and we poured in the lemon juice, and poured in the water, and poured in the sugar, and um, Guinness World Record came out, and and that was our first world record. Now, was there, how do you mix it together? Or did you, how, was it, I mean, did you have to make the world's largest blender or something too? Or <laughs> Well, um, we didn't have to, um, but we did. Um, <laughs> of course. You, know, you, you tend to be like the people you surround yourself with, right? So I ended up, um, you know, I have a lot of creative friends around me. And so we got together and we got, um, we made some giant um, tools that would go on the edge of, um, on the end of some power tools um, that would help us whip this thing up. And, um, and that's, that's what we did. And it, it, it worked and we mixed it all real good. And, um, and then we're looking at the same, what do we need to do with the lemonade? I mean, I'm going to have 800 gallons of lemonade. I'm just going <laughs> to open up the drain and pour it down the drain. Right. So I called the local organization, which I'm on the board now. And it's, um, it's called little lighthouse and there's a school for, um, uh, for disabled children, kind of a preschool for them. And, and I said, I would like to do a lemonade stand for you. <laughs> nice. And, and of course, they jumped on board and we just, you know, um, unlike a normal lemonade stand, we literally sold lemonade by the gallon all over the city. Yeah. And, um, and we ended up raising about $10,000 for them. Wow. This is awesome. 
This is awesome. Okay. That's, that is out of the box creative. I'm assuming there was marketing value for the store or stores as well. Yes. Oh yeah. We got all kinds of the press loved it. We, we had them all come out and we kept that cup of Chick-fil-A for, for quite a while. People would come up and take pictures with it. And, um, and you know, it was just, it was a lot of fun. So much so that you had to do it again. Well, we had to do it again because um, China um, broke our world record. No. They made some weird honey blueberry drink. You know, um, I'm not judging. I'm just saying that that's what they did. And so <laughs> so we set a new one for the world's um, largest sweet tea uh, because Chick-fil-A, you know, um, that's another um, item that people think we put drugs in. Yeah. Uh, and um, and we made the tea and we kind of did it similar to the same way. Um, I call I called everybody up said who wants to be a part of this and they jumped in and uh, we had a we we had to do some creative things like we had to make a 92 pound bag of tea <laughs> okay so so we, we actually um, had to sew together filters uh, until we could um, put all this tea in there and then we put the tea in there and the hot water in there and steeped it for um, the right time and then we had to use a fire truck um, with a, an extending ladder to lift up the uh, lift up the bag out of there because once it got waterlogged, it was probably about 700 pounds. Wow. And we got done with that. And then we um, added in about 2,500 pounds of sugar. Wow. And and water and ice. And um, and we're able to achieve the Guinness World Record again. And and for everyone listening, how big was that one? This one was, um, I was actually able to use the same cup, but I was able to get more made. So this one had 1,140 gallon lemonade. Or, I'm sorry, sweet tea. And how did we, did you have a sweet tea stand this time? What did you do with it? We did, but we, we didn't sell as much of it. It was 106 degrees that day in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh, wow. And um, so we ended up with um, probably about a third of the container left. And here's the funny part is, is we, we drained it down where we could. And we, we closed up for the night because it was, it was the end of the night. And I came up at 6 a.m. the next morning. And, uh, and I, I'm not a big drinker, but I know that, you know, when somebody orders a, a margarita, they put um, salt around the edge, right? Mm-hmm. So when I looked at this giant tea um, in the morning, I'm looking up at it in 10 feet high, and, and there's this rim around it. I'm thinking, what is in that rim? And as I got closer and closer, I realized it was bees. Oh, wow. Hundreds and thousands of bees. <laughs> Okay. And so um, if any one of the news cameras would have been out there that morning filming me as I'm trying to spray all these bees to get off the cup, it was quite amusing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Interesting. And again, I'm assuming that also helped marketing as well. This You, you have a creative way of making things happen and you don't really look at where, where you are as a, as a reason why you can't get somewhere else. Where would you say that thought process was developed? Well, a lot of it was the basic need of, I need, you know, if I'm going to, I don't like where my life is. I want to be somewhere else. Got and, it. and we didn't have the resources to do that. I didn't have the mentors in my life to do that. I didn't, and there was a lot of things that we just lacked because of, um, because of our financial, because of the mentality of my parents, a number of things. And so I had to, um, get very, very resourceful in order to make it happen. And so it's kind of a term that um, the term that I like to use is called, am I living remarkably? Hmm. Am I living in a way that people are going to remark about it? That's a good question. So that's one of the big things that kind of I, I, um, I throw out there when I, I do a lot of speaking engagements and I, and I demonstrate how are you living remarkably? How are you living your your life in business um, remarkably? How are you uh, marketing remarkably? How are you living um, as a boss remarkably? How are you living as a parent remarkably? As a spouse, you know anything from, for example, we like to put live alligators in my pool um, and and let the kids swim with them. I'm sorry. Say that again. I mean, I think I heard the words. I just want to make sure that you said what I think you said. Yes, um, I said I like to put live alligators in our swimming pool <laughs> and then we have a swimming pool party and we swim with the alligators okay and so um what we do is we um uh alligators um 
can't open their mouths very easily. So we, we duct tape them shut. And then we swim around with the alligators and, um, uh, and you know, it's one of those things that, you know, every year we do this, we've probably done this for about the last four or five years and it's a big deal. It's a big party that we have and everybody comes over and kids get to overcome their fears or they get to sit there and say, there's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Totally understood. Totally understood. Uh, any disclosures involved for attending this party? <laughs> yeah, I, I have to be careful about um, what I put, post on Facebook. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Got it. Got it. So for those that have listened this far and are intrigued either by your business philosophy, creative marketing, and or just figuring out for themselves, you know, how they might be able to finally get themselves in the game they they probably want to get more from you. They want to know more about what goes in what goes on in your brain. Uh, what's going to be the best way for them to to follow, to find out, and, and to grab more of what you have to share? Sure. Well, my um, I do have a website. It's arthurgreeno.com. Okay. And um, so I have a website that kind of goes into stuff. But um, um, just like you, and just like with a lot of people, you are more than welcome to follow me on on Twitter, um, on Facebook, or on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, I, I do a blog and, and I put, some, you know, it's, it's fun to do a blog because I'm always having these crazy stories of things I've done. So I'll, I'll put it, you know, put it in writing and put it out there and say, here's some life lessons to learn about, well, when you're putting alligators in the pool, what to look for <laughs> in case you ever needed it. In case you ever needed it. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Excellent. And where, and is the, where's the blog? Um, my blog is on my website, arthurgreeno.com, or um, we've been able to um, recently start posting it on LinkedIn. Oh, got it. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Okay, so as we wrap up here, I've got one question because I can only, um, I don't even know what your answer is going to be. It's going to be, I think it's going to be great though. So for, I'm going to pretend, let's pretend for a second that someone listening is standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They're thinking, man, I, I want to do this entrepreneur thing, but I'm not really sure. Or, uh, you know, it, it tends to happen anytime we want to step into something bigger than our current place. We want to reach for something great. We are often accompanied with that voice. And they're, they hear that voice right now every day, Arthur. And they want to be able to move forward. But that voice is always there. And for some of those people, they're related to that voice. What would you say? To that person, if you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that they would actually do what you suggested. What would I tell them? Yep. I, I would tell them that um, I would really, it'd be, you need to go for it. I mean, because uh, one of my friends uses the term pre-quitting. And, and huh. that's when you, when you quit before you even start. <laughs> wow. I like it. I'm, Three times it's his. Uh, we're we're going to use that one now. No pre-quitting allowed. This is a no pre-quitting zone. That's right. That's I right. like it. I like it 100%. Well, I, I definitely want to take this time to say thanks. Thank you for taking the time uh, to educate us about, as I've said before, one of the best food places I know, <laughs> as well as creative ways to, to go about doing business, whether that be a nine-foot tall cup of uh, lemonade or tea or or just figuring out that, that you know anything any obstacles that we may be pre presented with don't actually have to stop us um yeah so so thank you for taking the time to be here today it's my pleasure all right ladies and gentlemen you know what time it is it's time for you to move at the speed of instruction what does that mean today well today that simply means move because you've heard, again, that action is totally necessary. And don't tell me you can't be creative because I've never heard of a nine-foot tall cup of lemonade or, or tea. But today we did. And we even turned that into a life lesson because who knows? Maybe one day you want to swim with alligators too. Here's <laughs> the point. Make something happen today. It's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.